you guys are on the right track. There are a couple of different suggestions related to trees, and trees are definitely uh, the key, right? Um, for a while now, since uh, version 0 0.6, uh, data can be stored in hierarchical structures that can be thought of as a branching tree, right? And the data that is passing through a data tree is still stored in a list, but now each list, can, it has also a path. So that's a way for us to access the elements on that particular list. So now we can have lists of lists. And the paths are a series of indices describing the position of the data branch inside the tree. So here's the um, representation of, the of a data tree from the Grasshopper Primer. And you can see how um, the representation as a tree works because as we develop our file and define new relationships and resulting in new geometries or bits of data, our tree grows and at the end of every branch we have leaves, which are our data elements, right? Numbers, points, geometry, etc. So um, here's our representation of a data tree and how it looks uh, relative to the data that's stored on it. So we have across multiple branch levels, our data tree is increasing in depth as we move from the start of the file or the trunk across the um, series of operations resulting in our list of, in this case, three items. So if we had all of our transformations on one list, we're going to get one compound transformation. But the idea here is that we want to, uh, instead of moving along a path that terminates where everything is stored together, we want to carry on into the, uh, through the data tree and make it bigger by grafting it. And that will create a new branch or a new list for every item that we give it, right? So as opposed to before, where we had three elements on path 05, we're going to break that into individual lists by growing our data tree one more branch level through the graft operation. So in this case, we're going to have one item on the end of every list. And if we bring two grafted trees together, we'll have two items on the end of every list. All right, so let's go back to Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, and we're going to do a modification here. Remember that almost all of the data tree operations, the basic ones at least, can be found as individual objects under the sets tree tab. Uh, so you can grab the graft object, bring it down here, and we're going to graft the X output of move as well as the X output of rotate and replace our inputs for our merge. So now we have a compound transformation of two operations. We have one for each of the uh, objects that we're trying to uh, create. Right? So if we were to uh, go straight to the transform tab, go to utilities, and we're just going to execute some transformation. Let's drop this onto the canvas. And you'll see here this asks for just the geometry that we want to tra uh, transform and the transformation, whether it's a single one or not. So if I go back here and I bring my original geometry into G and the results of my move into T, this will do the same thing as our move because we're using the transformation information here. But if I do it from the compound version of this transformation, put that into T, I'm now getting uh, the result of multiple rectangles that are defined by each a compound transformation. Okay, so uh, we can keep doing this, um, carry forward, uh, do uh, more operations to uh, our rectangles. Um, and we can, we can do it for simple cases like this by just compounding the transformation. Um, but we can also use our transform matrix to determine how our set of operations should ha happen. And the matrix is going to give us the uh, combination of 
all of our compound transformations. So now we've got our transform matrix working, our compounds, and then our just generic transform happening here. We have now our resulting spiral. All right, so let's take a second and um, uh, let's experiment a little bit. Let's go into our merge input and add a few more inputs. And go ahead and use any of the transformation objects under Affine or Euclidean. And see if you can't um, layer more operations into your algorithm to create some interesting results. So let's take a couple minutes to do that. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to do one option while you guys are also experimenting. I'm going to be using the scale object. So I'm going to go ahead and just use the scale. This is going to be my step C. And if you want to try something else, uh, go ahead and take a second to do that. Remember that every one of the new transformation objects you add you have to graft it before it goes into the merge. And any new um, transformation you add, you also want to make sure you have a series that uses the same number input to define the scale factor or whatever input you're using. So I've got a scale working. Does anyone have any success with a different um, transformation that creates some interesting results? If you did, go ahead and let us know through the questions window, and we'll see if we can't um, do the same thing here together. All right, so we have um, one suggestion, which is a mirror. Um, let's take a look at that one. That's under Euclidean. So mirror an object. So for this one, we need to have a mirror plane. Um, so if we want each one of these to mirror, we need a local plane for each one. So this is a little bit different because all of the other operations we're using are only bound by, let's say, a factor and a center point, and we're using the global center 000 for all of those inputs. Um, so we have to do one additional step if we want to also mirror, which would be to um, find a plane at each one of these um, rectangle locations. So let's try something where we um, actually use our um, geometry, we're going to move and rotate. Let's also move and rotate a point. Uh, so what I'm going to do is here, after my uh, geometry, this is only going to work if I'm using a rectangle or a closed polyline. Let's use a curve analysis polygon center to find the center point. And I'm going to need to um, move and rotate that set of, uh, that point to each one of my corresponding locations. So I'm going to copy and paste my transform back here and reuse it for my point. So that's going to give me a, a local point for each one. 
So in this way, I'm probably going to have to use, because I need a point for each one of my objects, I need to do this after my collection of uh, operations here. Or at least this is uh, one, I think, clear way to go about doing it. All right, so um, this is going to be our geometry to mirror. And we now need to create a plane that's based on this, um, this point. So let's go ahead and find a, from the vector plane tab, a YZ plane. And use that point to define where the plane should be. And then use that plane to define the mirror. Okay, so now each one is also mirroring about the vertical plane at the location. That's pretty interesting because if I add more and um, decrease the scale, we can see this is for rotate. This is my scale step. We can see that as I move around the spiral, because the plane is always vertical in the YZ direction, it's giving us an interesting uh, result in terms of how these objects are then all oriented. So that's a pretty interesting um, suggestion. Thanks for that. And um, if you have any other questions about the, uh, the matrix transformations, let's go ahead and address them now before we move on to the next exercise. All right, so let's move on to um, the next series of exercises. And um, I'm going to pass the uh, controls over to Ronnie.